interesting. Everyone, thank you everyone for coming out today for Amelia Earhart's birthday on July 24th. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. This has taken three years of planning uh, to do this. Obviously, last year and a half was sort of a wash for everybody. Uh, but we're happy to be here actually on a Saturday on Amelia's birthday. Uh, this could not have been done without Ian Wright, the director of the Oakland Aviation Museum, who is somewhere looking at us. Thank you, Ian. And lovely Gail. Um, we have a couple guest speakers. One of them, however, is uh, on his way to Howland Island right now. He's probably about a couple clicks away from getting here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dana Stimmer. Dana, are you here? Okay, and Dana is the president of the Howland Island, um, le uh, leader of the first ever deep water sonar search for Earhart's Lockheed Electra airplane in the Central Pacific in 1999. And plans are in the works for a second expedition, either this September or next. So Dana, you wanna come up? Tell us a little bit of what's going on. When I look back on the significance of the ground we're standing on right now. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, when I look back on the significance of the ground we are standing on right here, right now, in regards to Amelia's flying career, we are standing on ground zero of her two attempts to be the first to fly around the world at the equator, uh, which is roughly 24,000 miles. People have flown around the world before, but north, um, but nobody has done it with, uh, at the equator. Um, Pop mark and wet runways. If you look at the uh, footage of Amelia taking off on her two attempts, there were very rough run runways out here. Uh, and uh, like I said, wet and pop mark, so not an easy uh, departure. The second attempt started on May 27th, May 20th, 1937. And maybe it's a good time right now in 2021 to reflect back on the 1930s and what was going on then. The world was in the depths of the Great Depression, but at the same time there were amazing achievements. The Golden Gate Bridge was just being finished uh, in record time, same with the entire state building. Uh, art, architecture, and music um, were all achieving great uh, successes. Marian Anderson uh, in her music, uh, Josephine Baker in her movies were pouring out beautiful and stunning performances. And maybe the best of all, the people were coming together to help one another during that. 1930s Great Depression. Amelia has a number of remarkable mi milestones, setting flying records and firsts, to enhancing women's rights and even changing fashion standards. But I think her greatest legacy is that, it, that she continues to inspire. So the inspiration, here we are, generation after generation, over 80 years on from her disappearance, and she still continues to inspire. From young women joining the astronaut corps to the professional pilots, to writers and adventurers. And on a personal level, she inspired me to undertake this seemingly impossible task of finding the Electra in 18,000 feet of water near Howland Island and finding out what happened to her in the early morning hours of July 2nd, 1937. So a message to all the young people here today. Find something you can be passionate about and grab onto it and don't let it go. Whether it's science, the arts, sport, or something you never before imagined. As you develop your natural God-given talents and path, the path will become more obvious. Choose well, because hopefully it will be something that will take you on an amazing journey for the rest of your lives. As Amelia said, the most difficult thing is the courage to act. The rest is mere tenacity. The fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. You can act. 
to change and control your life. And the procedure, the process, is its own reward. So it's about the journey. So pick something that you really think you will be good at, grab a hold of it, and be inspired by Amelia and by your own achievements. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce uh, John Horton, who is the president of the board of the Oakland Aviation Museum. Yeah. Well, let me welcome everyone here today. We're very honored that you came. This is a very momentous occasion, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. There's uh, been a lot of effort put into putting this uh, into place, and so um, for that, thank you very much. up perfectly, I would like to introduce ex-Noble Grand Humbug, Rick Saber. <laughs> Flying in on the seat of his pants. The sweetheart of the airways created a firestorm of followers when she lifted off from this very spot in 1937. Then successfully... <laughs> Flew her Lockheed 10 Electra, twin-engine plane across most uh, most continents. She braved the elements, lack of navigational fixes, long legs as a single pilot under primitive short runways, landings and takeoffs in the dark on unlit fields, and far more challenges than the norms of today. With my 26,000 plus hours of flying in modern, reliable aircraft, with backup pilots, fresh coffee, and a convenient head, I've often mused over her extreme sense of confidence. With most legs of the world completed on her landing in Ley, New Guinea, she had covered over 22,000 miles, and she only had 7,000 to go. It was, however, her final flight into destiny. Lake, the lake from Ley to the tiny, teeny dot of Howland Island in the South Pacific was an astonishing 2,256 miles all over desolate and endless ocean, previously unconquered by air and seldom by boat. Fast forward to the late Howland leg, liftoff from the short 3,000-foot hard pack airstrip got her in the air with uh, only about 150 yards before it ended abruptly into the sea. On rotation, a puff of dust was seen neath her plane on the same spot as her critical VHF antenna. This would deny her communications both departing, lay, and arriving near Howland. Much of the flight, unfortunately, was below cloud levels which prevented Fred Noonan, her navigator, from reliable fixes using a sextant, fairly prehistoric in flying. An ADF direction finder was planned to be on her flight, but not yet adapted to it. That would have helped her a great deal to find the tiny dot of Howland. On arrival in the Howland area, the two Coast Guard cutters, Ontario and Atasca, were updated with high-frequency communication Unfortunately, without the frequencies that she had on her plane, and vice versa. That would help her steer to the tiny island and triangulate her accurate location. All these factors played in as she tried to find Howland before running her tanks dry. It is believed that she had seen Nicormororo Islet about 356 miles south-southeast of Howland, and she sculpted it out, passed over it, and then landed on a reef close by the wreck of a ship that had grounded in 1929. I joined the International Group for a Historic Aircraft Recovery in 2017 on one of their nine searches in the past 22 years of looking for Amelia. Leaving Fiji due north for 900 miles on a small ship sponsored by National Geographics, 
our expedition of 53 archaeologists, anthropologists, scientists, divers, crew of 20 plus four forensically trained dogs capable of locating human remains down to a depth of about eight feet and up to maybe about 90 years. We set out for 27 days headed to Nicomororo, the tiny uninhabited pinnacle of an island in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Louder? But we saw but one Filipino trawler on our entire journey. I was one of the four scuba divers tasked with trying to locate the starboard landing gear which sheared off of her plane when she landed on a close-in fringing reef before it drops off from three to 6,000 feet. Unable to anchor due to our depths, the base ship that we, level, we stayed on loped along for 24 and seven for that entire period we were on the islet uh, with one engine of theirs shut down to save it. After Amelia vanished and flew into history to July 1937, it is believed that Amelia and Fred Noonan successfully landed on the reef, set up a rough camp nearby on the island, returned nightly to send out Mayday reports via high frequency and using the starboard engine of her airplane with a generator to power the high frequency uh, transmitter, then survived a, for a time as a castaways, drinking water captured from rain squalls and surviving on small fish, turtles, and clams. Numerous high frequency fixes were from her nightly signals reported by the Coast Guard and several Pan American Airway radio direction finding stations in the vast Pacific. Many small finds were made on the islet, including metal cladding similar to the Lockheed, but none at all sufficient to conclusively prove their fate. Amelia's secrets are safe for the moment, but searches will continue forever due to her timeless popularity. On the first legs of her first round the world trip, Amelia gazed west from San Francisco before coming over here to take off to the wide Pacific, then again in Miami, marveling at the sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, commenting both times, it's a very big ocean and so much water. And please don't be concerned. It just seems I must try this flight. With it behind me, life will be much more complete. and I will have a time to grow old and remember my historic flight. When I go, I'd like to go in my plane quickly. In that, she did get her final wish. In my 42 years in the air, I concur about the vastness of the seven seas and how many other secrets are remaining to be covered under the ocean's depths. Thank you very much. All right, without further ado, I believe that uh, some people would like to see what's behind this, the, the red curtain. I would now like to introduce Chris Hot Dog Carney, the noble grand humbug of Yerba Buena number one, the mother lodge of E. Clampsis Vitus, and Steve Stumpy Larson, noble grand humbug of Joaquin Marietta. Hail Joaquin. Chapter 13. Dun, 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 dun. Wait, hold on, hold on. Let's hear the brethren! Satisfactory! And to, and to seal this deal, Anchor Steam is our official beer. Pour it all out. Yeah. Where did he go? All right. Uh, yeah. What say the brethren? So And I will read the plaque to you since you guys are all the way out there. 
One of her quotes that I loved was, there's more to life than being a passenger. How's that? Can you guys hear me out there? Yes. Affirmative. Medium rare? Yes. Like a sizzler steak? Okay. Just 600 feet south of where you now stand was Oakland's old Northfield runway, where aviatrix Amelia Earhart made history. On January 11th, 1935, Earhart flew alone from Honolulu and landed at Northfield, becoming the first person to fly solo to the U.S. mainland from Hawaii. Earhart's next ambition was to become the first woman to fly around the world. And on March 17, 1937, she took off from Northfield again with Navy, uh, navigator, navigators, sorry, pardon my French, navigators Fred Noonan and Harry Manning and technical advisor Paul Mance on board. Unfortunately, after landing at Pearl Harbor, she had to call off the trip due to equipment failure during her following takeoff. Earhart soon announced plans for a second attempt, flying west to east this time. With Newton as navigator, she departed Oakland on May 20th, 1937 in a custom-built Lockheed Electra, making stops in Florida, Brazil, Africa, India, Australia, and Papua New Guinea. On July 2nd, 1937, with only 7,000 nautical miles remaining to Oakland, Amelia Earhart's plane mysteriously disappeared in the South Pacific on the way to Howland Island. Adventure is worthwhile in itself. I would now like to introduce Christine Oxus of the 99's Women in Aviation. Thank, Thank you, Christine, you. for coming. Yes. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thank you everyone for uh, planning the event and hosting this today, Ian especially. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, my name is Christine. I am a licensed pilot. I'm a certified flight instructor, and I'm currently teaching people to fly in the East Bay in a variety of aircraft with um, I have a really wonderful group of students these days. Um, many of my students are women, and I'm also uh, the chapter chair of the Bay Cities 99s, which is a organization of women pilots. Uh, it's an interna international organization. Before I was a pilot, I didn't know very much about Amelia Earhart. I knew she was a pilot. And I knew she was one of the first. Uh, when I got my private pilot license in 2014, I got a 99's magazine and thought, okay, cool, this is a group of women that are pilots. Maybe I should join and, and check it out. And through the 99's, I got to know a lot more about Amelia Earhart. For those of you that don't know, the 99's are an inter international organization of women pilots. And we were founded in about 1929. Pilot and journalist Faye Gillis sent out letters to all 117 licensed, with licensed uh, women pilots in existence. She wanted to create an informal group to, as it says in the letter, tip each other off on what's going on in the industry and probably complain about sexism, who knows? While only 26 women gathered at the first meeting in November of 1929, the club turned into more of an organization as word spread and more pilots sent in the letters that they would like to attend meetings. Several months later, Amelia Earhart herself was elected as the first president, and it was time to choose a name of the organization. So people threw out the ideas such as Angels Club, interesting, Bird Women, really glad we didn't go with that one. Amelia Earhart was like, no, we're not doing that. She suggested the nomenclature number of participants and throw an S on the end, and the 99s were born, the name stuck. Our chapter here in the Bay Area is 89 years old, and we honor Amelia's legacy and work through our continued advancement of women pilots. It's a joy to see women of all ages realize their dream of flight, take risks, challenge themselves, much as Amelia would have appreciated and I'm sure encouraged as she did herself. We currently have 85 members in the Bay Cities chapter. Um, I see Wendy over here. If anyone else is here, give a wave. It's great to see your faces. Uh, we host fly-ins, events, scholarships. We hosted an amazing scholarship this year for student pilots and advanced ratings. Um, the museum here helps us out each year with a Girl Scout in Aviation event. Um, so thanks again to Ian for, for letting us host that every year here. It's a success. And our goal today in the Bay Cities chapter is the same as it was when Amelia started the organization. Uh, we aim to advance women pilots through education, scholarships, mutual support, all while honoring our unique history and sharing our passion for flight. 
It is said that 99s have friends at every airport, and that's definitely true. I've met some of my closest friends through the 99s as I've grown as a pilot myself. The fun of finding fellow members extends around the world to every continent. Especially over the last year, we've branched out digitally and met many more women pilots around the world. 99s, especially Amelia and the 99 women that started the organization, feel that contacts with these members and the resultant exchange of ideas with flying women of other countries creates a closer understanding among people through the common bond of aviation. And it's wonderful to see so many people here today sharing that common bond of a love of aviation. So I'll ask today, how many pilots do we have here? Show of hands. Awesome. How many student pilots do we have here? Anyone a student pilot working on their training? Uh, how many aviation enthusiasts do we have? <laughs> Everyone. Great. Um, I never thought I would be influenced by Amelia Earhart because I never thought I would be a pilot. I did not see myself being a pilot. And I'm sure many women don't until they start flying or are connected with someone that is a pilot and go up and experience flight for the first time. But whether you are a student pilot, a pilot, or an aviation enthusiast, if you listen to quotes by Amelia Earhart as we've heard several read today already, you'll hear themes of equality, challenging oneself, and looking ahead and thinking about what's next. So whether you are a pilot or not, I think it's a valuable message for us all today um, to consider what Amelia uh, accomplished and remember her on this July 24th. Thanks. An adventurer, a fashion designer, an advocate for women. Um, but if there's one word that I, when I always think of her, I think of courageous. And uh, she just had no fear, and I think that's amazing. And if she did have fear, then she showed it as natural because it's natural to have it. Um, before we do the retiring of the colors, I would just like to make an announcement that uh, after the retiring of the colors, we will have the Yerba Buena Jug Band playing some lovely music for you out here. But then I encourage everyone to go into the brand new opening today, Amelia Earhart Room, which will be displayed in the conference room. When you go in, it'll be on the right-hand side, it's opening up now. And uh, Joanne Grant will be available there to answer any questions. You can see some of the things that actually were once owned by Amelia in the room, and some of her awards and trinkets and things from the past in the room, uh, in the Amelia Earhart Room. But uh, once again, I'd just like to thank everyone here for coming out today for the Amelia Earhart uh, Day. And I'd like to thank Ian one more time again. A round of applause for Ian. He's amazing. And now I'm going to ask the uh, color bar guard to retire the colors. <laughs>